We've been making a lot of material stuff. Uh, let's talk about material instances and parameters, because do you really want to make a whole separate material for every object in your game? Well, to a certain extent, you have to. Uh, but there's also some optimization to be done there. So what we have is we've got our tutorial material, and then we've got this weird as just keyboard mesh material. And today we're going to add a third material to that. But from that, we're going to be able to make a bunch of different materials. So let's just call this a like flat color. And if we open that up, we get our usual material graph. So we're going to uh, add a color node here to the base color, and we're going to set the color to like pink or something, something very vibrant. Now, if we want to make a second material here that is, for instance, blue instead, you might think, okay, let me just like copy this over with control D and say flat color blue, and then going in and changing this to blue. But now these are two separate materials, which I'm not going to bore you with too much of the technical mumbo jumbo, uh, but it is not particularly efficient to render separate materials when you don't have to. So what we can do instead is not make this flat color blue material, because that's a very, very bad idea. We can right click this color node here, and we can convert it to a parameter, which works the same way as you are maybe used to in programming. A parameter in a function or an event is just a bit of data that you can pass in whenever a function is called. And the same thing here. Whenever we make a material that is referencing this as its source, which I'll explain to you in a moment, don't you worry about that, it will give us just a little bit of a field in which we can input the color that we want that specific instance of it to be. So we can call this uh, color and this will now be the default value that this color has. With that, we can right click this flat color and we can and we can create a material instance instead, which seems like it will just be a material, but let's call this flat color blue. And if we open this up, we don't get a material graph. Instead, we get this preview here. And on the right hand side, we get our global vector parameter values. You can give these values categories to make them a little bit more organized. But if we say, hey, we want to enable this one, uh, we can just change this. And now we have this material, but with a blue value instead. A material instance is a lot more efficient to render than separate materials, because more or less what happens is the engine renders your scene one material at a time. And there is a little bit of time in like, wrapping up the rendering of one material and starting up the rendering of the next material. And these material instances are counted as the parent material. So if we have 50 instances of this material, those will all be getting rendered at the same time before we move on to the next parent material with all of the instances that that includes. That's a bit of an oversimplification of how it works, but in general, that is the way uh, you can look at it. So most games will have one big master material because most objects won't actually require that much more work than just, hey, these are the texture maps that you're going to be using. Go ahead and just run this as one material. So let's do one of those real quick. We can just say uh, this is like material master material. And for those, we can add in a texture sample node and that will be our base color, for instance. Let's set a default value for that just to gray and if we right click this we can convert this to a parameter as well so we can call this the base color or the albedo map as it's also known and then add another texture sample and we'll just add in a couple of texture samples here because we're going to be using a few uh going into the metallic and one into the roughness and one into the emissive color, and then one into the normal, and so on and so forth. Now, one little note here is we are using a separate parameter now for metallic, for roughness, and if you wanted to use it, the ambient occlusion as well. And you can actually combine those into one text map to save a little bit of video memory, because we'll talk about that a little bit later on in this video. Uh, but for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to convert this to a parameter, and this will be the metallic parameter. This will be the roughness parameter. We have an emissive parameter now, and we'll also then make ourselves the normal map parameter. 
give all of these a default value as well. Um, for the metallicness, we want that to be black. For the roughness, we probably want that to be gray by default as well. Emissive, of course, we want to be black. And Unreal Engine comes with these very uh, lightweight textures that you can use, like black and gray, just as default values. They are literally only a couple of pixels big, so they're really lightweight. If you don't supply any alternative, like texture maps for them, they're going to be very efficient uh, on your material. And then the normal map, I believe it also has a empty a base flatten normal map. Just if we open that up, you can see um, the size is one by one pixel. It's just one pixel, but you need to give it a value in order for the shader to actually work. And the same thing here with the black. Uh, this one is 32 by 32. Still a very lightweight texture, right? So now we have our master material and we can create a material instance for like our uh, material instance, uh, like our hero character or something like that, right? And in that we can supply all of the color maps that we have from like Substance Painter or from Blender or whatever we use to make our 3D art. And now most of the characters in our game can use the material instances from that parent material. Meaning, again, it's going to be efficient to render. Now, we talked a little bit a moment ago about uh, the fact that the metallic and the roughness map and stuff like that, those are all grayscale maps, right? The base color, of course, has red, green, and blue values because we want to be able to mix colors and like have like yellow in there as well, like brown and whatever color we want. We don't need that for the metallic and roughness and ambient occlusion and a couple of other things as well because those are just simply like zero to one values that you input so you don't actually need to use a unique texture for those you can combine those into one texture you see if you have a for instance uh pearl and noise texture right this texture even though it is only black and white it stores information on red green and blue channels to create that white which is redundant because those red, green, and blue channels are all going to be the same because the output is going to be in grayscale. So what we can do instead is if you use something like Substance Painter and you're like baking your material maps uh, in there, it has a preset for this for Unreal, I believe, which automatically does this. If you're doing this in Blender, maybe you need to do a little bit of compositing, import things into Photoshop and combine them. Uh, but let me pull up my own project and show you a packed map. So here we are in my own uh, game project. Don't mind the absolute mess that the root folder is here, but we have a texture map here that is a joint material occlusion roughness metallic, as it is called. So if I open that up and show you, you can see this looks like an absolute mess of a texture. And that is because it's got the RGB all overlapping each other. But if I now import this into a material real quick uh, to show you, we can put this into the base color and it looks like the mess that we just saw. Um, but now, if I only pull out the red channel from this texture, it's only going to be showing me the red channel. And that stands suddenly a grayscale value again. And if we look at uh, the order of the name here, it uses occlusion roughness metallic. So red will be the occlusion, ambient occlusion. And then green, if we look at that, that would be the roughness. So this is the roughness map. So we can put that into there. Let's actually just put all of these in the right pins right away. And then we have blue, which is the metallic map. And this is everything uh, how metallic it should be. So this can go into the metallicness. And now let's just give this a like 60% gray value or something like that. And this is now what our material map looks like when it's all properly hooked up we have these three different things all stored in one texture meaning that it only needs to load in one image instead of three separate images meaning that we're only using one third the amount of memory in order to run this shader and while we're in here i might as well show you uh, a little bit of material instancing as well so this is the parent material for all of my enemies the enemies have uh this thing where they can like fade away once they die and all my enemies have this same material so this is all of the like logic to run that material with like a pearl and noise texture sample and a little math and stuff like that and if I then go into the material, uh, turning off auto exposure here real quick so you guys can actually see, uh, the material for one of my enemies, 
I can click on this icon here and preview it on the actual mesh that I have at this point selected in my content browser. So this is the enemy itself. You can see I have a bunch of parameters here, stuff like the dissolve in. So if I decrease this, you can see that that material does that dissolving effect. I've got my uh, base color for my lamp. I've got my emission map. And in this material, I still have the metallic and the roughness in separate texture maps. Because when I made this initially, I was still doing stuff in Blender rather than in Substance Painter. I didn't really feel like every time exporting a model, also combining those texture maps into one packed map because I was lazy. Do as I say, not as I do. I still need to go back over this material and combine those and pack those together at some point. Now, one final fun thing is if we, for instance, uh, go back to our uh, flat color material here in our uh, example project that I've been using, we can actually set these parameters on runtime as well. So if we uh, go and make a, a quick blueprint here, uh, just an actor, we'll call that PP color changer. I will add in a static mesh here. Uh, we'll just do a normal cube. And here in the construction script, what we'll do is we'll get the static mesh. Uh, we want to set the material on that static mesh. And we're going to set this to a dynamic material instance. So we can create a dynamic material instance. And that lets you select a parent material. This lets you select either a material or a material instance. Generally, when you do this, you choose a parent material, like not an instance material. So let's use our flat color material here. Uh, we can give some optional values that we're not going to worry about right now. And then the output pin here is going to be a reference to the newly created material instance that we can change things about on runtime. So uh, we can say set parameter. And here we can set a bunch of different stuff uh, as far as parameters go. So we can set a, a vector parameter, we can set a, a texture parameter even. But for us, what we want to do is we want to set a vector parameter by value. So this puts in a, a linear color value and the parameter name, this is very important. This needs to match exactly with what we call this. So this is color with a capital C. So we'll just say color and then the value we're going to uh, promote to a variable and this will be the color we'll just expose that so we can add it in the viewport and then after that we're going to use the dynamic material instance that we just created to set that as the material for our cube so now we can see that our cube will be black because that's the default value of our color now, uh, we also probably, like, the alpha doesn't really do anything in this case. But if we set this to, like, pink, you can see immediately it shows up as pink. And we can do this in the viewport on a per instance basis now. Do be aware that these things are relatively intensive to uh, run. Because what you're effectively doing is for every single one of these objects, you're making a new material instance. And not just a material instance, a material instance that has to keep parameters exposed to be able to be changed on a runtime. Because you can also change these as the game plays. But now you can see, we can set these uh, values on a per case basis, even though they share the same parent material. So uh, that's all really good, really powerful. You can do a lot of fun stuff with this. Uh, for instance, on begin play, we can do a timeline. And we need to do a couple of other things here. We need to uh, promote this to a variable real quick. Material instance, just so that we can access it from the rest of the event graph. And let's just copy this over. Um, I think that makes the most sense. We can lurk this linear color between uh, two different colors now. So let's say, hey, we want to lurk this between like blue and maybe red instead of using the color variable that we just made. You can, of course, make these two color variables and stuff like that. I'm sure you get the point there. Uh, in the timeline itself, let's make a uh, flow track. Set the length to five, that's fine. We add a key at zero, zero, and then we add a key at five, one. And that will then loop between these two colors. And we can use that timeline component uh, that we have now to set looping to being true, just out of the loops. 
and now we'll see that as we play the game it will uh, go from blue to red and then once it reaches the end of the timeline it will loop around so it will just reset back to blue so this is how you can like animate a color like that and of course you can get a lot more complex with this with certain materials uh, only being a part of the model of course those being the only thing that can change colors and you can be very creative with this right this is pretty much the rundown on what both interior instances can do for you with parameters and also then using those parameters dynamically on runtime to uh, do a lot of cool stuff with and for the full course if you're watching this in the future it should be all up on the youtube channel already but if you're watching this shortly after it was uploaded there will be a link down below in the description to the patreon where you can find the full course and a very big thank you to all of my patreons you can see them on screen right now if you want to help out supporting the channel there's a link down below in the description to the patreon page and a special thanks to my cave digger tier patreons sergey thomas